And behold, a great tempest arose in the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The apostles are very surprised with what is happening. They are together with Christ in the boat. Nothing bad can happen to them, so they think. Christ is with them. However, a big storm arises and our Lord does nothing to save them. On the contrary, he is sleeping. The apostles then try to take control of the boat, but all efforts are in vain. They get very nervous and decide to awaken Christ. Lord, save us, we perish. To their astonishment, the first thing Christ says is in the form of a rebuke. Our Lord reproves their lack of faith. There is no reason to be afraid. No matter how great the storm, God is always in control. The apostles should know this fact by now. If we call ourselves followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, we must have a strong faith. We must see everything with the eyes of faith, especially when in the middle of trials. The storm incident happened because there is a lesson to be learned, a lesson for the apostles, and they learned the lesson, a lesson for all of us. The storm is a figure of the spiritual tempests which assail the human soul. Temptation affects not only sinners, but also those who live in God's presence and are engaged in his work. We should not be surprised or saddened if Despite the presence of Christ and our union with him, by grace, we are attacked by many temptations. I will give you a couple of examples from the lives of the saints. The first is from the life of Saint Catherine of Siena. One day she was tempted very much with bad thoughts, but by the grace of God, she put them all away. Not long afterwards, our Lord appeared to her in a visible manner. As soon as she saw him, she cried out, Oh my God, where were you when the devil was tempting me with those wicked thoughts? My daughter, he replied, I was in the midst of your heart all the time. Oh, my dearest Lord, said the saint, is it possible that you could have been there in the midst of such frightful temptations? Yes, my child, I was there watching over you when you were fighting against them and helping you to overcome them. And when I saw how much you detested them for love of me, my heart was filled with the greatest joy. The second example is taken from the life of the monks of the desert. A certain novice complained to the abbot Theodore that he had been for eight years trying to overcome his evil inclinations and that he had not yet been able to do this, but that they still annoyed him. My brother, replied the abbot, you complain of this warfare for, of eight years, and I have spent 70 years in solitude, and during all that time, I have not for a single day 
been free from temptations. And every day during all these years, I ha have had to contend with my evil inclinations so that I might be able to keep them in subjection. <clears throat> it is only when this life is ended, the abbot said, that our struggle against temptation will come to an end. <clears throat> we read in the scriptures, because thou wast acceptable to God, it was necessary that temptation should prove thee. As long as we are in the company of our Lord and blessed with his friendship, we should not worry about the assaults of temptation. Remember the words of the Apostle Saint Paul. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able to endure. But with temptation, he will make also a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. <clears throat> Saint James also says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he hath been proved, he shall receive the crown of life, which God hath promised to them that love him. When our passions, the devil, the world, attack us in the form of violent temptations, we should have recourse to God. This is the means which all the saints have employed against the enemies of their salvation. In the prayer of the Our Father, we are instructed to seek the divine assistance against temptation. We pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So prayer is absolutely necessary. But we learn in today's gospel that prayer is not enough. We see this in the rebuke of Christ to the apostles. It does not suffice to pray. We ought to pray well. That is, when we should and as we should. The fault of the apostles was not in their asking Christ for help or in having awakened Christ from sleep. Those things are good. We should imitate the apostles in that. But their fault was that they did not pray until they saw themselves on the point of perishing. Until then, they had depended on themselves and had looked to their own efforts to escape a shipwreck. We should not wait until the temptation is so great that we cannot overcome it without an extraordinary help and grace of God. At the very approach of danger, especially spiritual danger, we should call for help. Presumption and self-trust not only do not overcome temptations, they are themselves a way, a form of temptation. The second fault we see in the apostles is that their prayer was not accompanied with real confidence in Christ. Yes, it is true, they invoked Christ, but they seem to doubt at the same time. We shouldn't doubt. If we pray, we have to have the confidence. God is almighty. He can hear our prayers. He can give us what we need. Their petition was also lacking in reverence. Saint Mark's account of the incidents that we just read in the gospel, he has the apostle saying, Master, doth it not concern thee that we perish? And this obviously is irreverent, so don't you care about us? That was the way in which the apostles were praying. And how many times we do the same thing? We show irreverence when we pray. Why this happens to me? Don't you care about me? 
Many times we complain instead of praying. Yes, we should pray with confidence, but also with respect. Confidence preserves our respect from becoming pusillanimity. Respect secures our confidence from degenerating into presumption. Although the prayer of the apostles was not such as it should have been, still it was heard by Jesus Christ. Thus, his infinite goodness often overlooks the imperfections that accompany the acts of the just. He remembers, as the prophet says, that they are flesh, a wind that goeth and returneth not. He excuses the feebleness of their piety, and he has regard rather to their intention of, of serving him than to the quality of their service. In our necessities, let us implore God with all our heart. And when we shall have done what is possible according to the measure of our grace, we may be assured that on his side he will not be wanting in the help he has promised. To each of us he addresses the consoling words, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. He also says, Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.